In this series, over the last couple of weeks, Pastor Jonathan has done an amazing job talking to us about the foundational pieces in our life. When, when you pull up in front of a house and, and you look at the house and no matter, no matter what, how beautiful it may be, you don't pull up and go, man, that foundation is unbelievable. No, you pull up and you see the architecture and what's holding it up. And, and all of that is able to be there because of a strong foundation. No matter what location you walked in today, you didn't, you didn't walk in Midtown or Bulverde or, or Stone Oak and you didn't walk in and go, man, this foundation is one of the best. No, you walked in and you're grateful the ceiling didn't fall in on you. And the reason that happens is because there's a good foundation. And so as we talk about this over these weeks, that you have a strong foundation so you can live an unshakable life. And a foundation that is not easily shaken. Because we live in a world that is constantly changing and constantly shaking and all you have to do is look at your news channel or, or, or your outlet that you look at or your social media or if you have an iPhone, just keep scrolling left. And for most of us, it goes to the news and stock market. Some of the kids have put some widgets and witchcraft and stuff on there. I don't know what it does, but like for most of us, it'll tell you what the news is and you're going to see wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and famine and racial tension. And all the craziness of social media and a whole new world of AI issues with artificial intelligence and some of the chaos that it is causing in our world. But I, I want to remind you today that you can live unshakable. You don't have to be tossed around by everything that happens. You don't have to live in fear. You don't have to live in dread. You don't have to live paralyzed in your decisions are worried about your future. So today I want to talk about one of the foundational pieces that will make our life unshakable as we continue in this series. We're going to take our theme verse through the series, which has been Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 and 25. And this is Jesus talking, and this is what he said. Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Anyone who hears these words of mine. He said, the rain came down, the stream rose, the wind blew and beat against that house. Sounds like life. Sounds like the chaos that we deal with. Sounds like, like, like troubles come at us, that, that there's family issues, that there's financial issues, that there's health issues, that, that just life, just the crazy chaotic world happens. He said, yet it did not fall. Because it had its foundation on the rock. Verse 26 said, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man whose house is built on the sand. The rain come, the streams rose, the winds blew, and it beat against, life happened and beat against this house, and it fell with a great crash. Maybe you've lived that life. Maybe your life has been built on some things that you didn't, and you didn't have a strong foundation, and you crashed. Maybe you've seen family members and friends, and they've crashed because their foundation wasn't right. Jesus made it clear in this passage that the foundation of your life must be built on his word. You must make the word of God, the Bible, the, uh, the unshakable piece of the foundation I want to talk about today is the Bible, and making it the centerpiece of your life to build that life that is unshakable. So when there's unrest all around you, you can have peace. So when the world is shaking, you can stand with confidence and know that the word of God has, has, is the foundation that I've built my life on. And I don't have to shake when everyone else is shaking. I don't have to be afraid when everyone else is afraid. That I can live a life that, is, that I can be sure of because I know that I've built my life on this foundation. As a matter of fact, in your life, the Bible must be important in your life. It can't just be another book that, that just lies around your house, that rides around in your back seat, or maybe it never gets talked about. It can't be just another book. When we look at the word Holy Bible, if we break that down, in the Greek, it's biblios. Biblos, as some would say, and 
It simply means book. Some of y'all were waiting for something a little deeper. You're like, I came to church for that. You told me the word book means book. Okay, that's awesome. But it's the other part of it. It's the word holy. Because that means set, aside, set apart for God's use. It's ordained. So the Holy Bible isn't just a collection of books, a random gathering of stories, but it's God's love letter to you and I. It's his redemption plan for mankind. It's his words of life to give us direction and how to live our lives. So it's a holy book that needs to be set apart in our lives. The Bible is special. It's holy. It's the word of God. Your attitude towards the Bible is important. How you and I view it matters. Now, when I first started preaching, and I preached my first sermon over 30 years ago. Somebody's got, this is getting old. It's not me. Uh, kids, I'm older than Google. So, yeah, yeah, I am. Um, but when I, this is, this is my, my first Bible outside of a children's Bible. My parents bought me this when, before I was a teenager. And um, they gave me this Bible. And I would, and I preached my first sermon out of it. And it was terrible. And then I preached another sermon out of it, and it was terrible. And then they let me preach again, and it was terrible again. And I'm not sure why they let me keep doing that. Somebody should have stopped me, probably. But just know that God has had mercy on all of you. You didn't have to hear those. And we're just somewhat better now. But I would, I would, and I was trying to be like the old preachers would do, and so I'd probably say things, and I didn't even know what I meant when I sat them, and like say it in a tone. And, but one of the things I would say is if you have your Bibles today, turn with me to, and you would hear, you would hear this. All over, all over the room, all over the room. And then I would say something, because I heard the old preacher say it. I would say, all right, say amen when you, when you get to the text. And about a third of the people be, amen. Like, yeah, a bunch of braggers. But <laughs> what you would then hear is, slow down. And then people would take like big chunks so they wouldn't hear the pages turn because they didn't want to get caught because they haven't found Obadiah yet because they don't even know if that's in the Bible. <laughs> they're like, what's this preacher talking? And they're just turning big chunks. And then, then they're going to the front. They're going real slow and they're trying to kind of like cover it. And they're trying to get to the table of contents. But there's so many like forwards and, and maps and bunch of other pages and that they can't find the table of contents. And they finally find it. And they're like, hey, what page number? And they're like, I don't know. We don't have the same Bible. It's not going to be like that. And so then you're freaking out because is Obadiah even in the Bible? And finally, you'd hear that last page turn and you'd already told everybody to be seated. And... Um, but, but we would, I, would, I started preaching with a paper Bible. I want to encourage you to get a paper Bible. Uh, I want to encourage you to bring it to church with you. Kind of a novel idea, a good place to bring it. Uh, it needs to go a lot of other places too. And if you don't have one, buy one. And if you can't afford one or don't know which one to buy, we have them at every location. Just go to the next steps counter and say, I want one of those Bibles that Pastor Matt was talking about. They are free. I want to make sure that you get the word of God in your hand. I want to make sure that you have access to get this book in your hands. Because it's popular, and especially with social media, it's popular to deconstruct the scripture, to pick it apart to use it out of context to justify actions. Some will say that it's outdated. Others will say that it's archaic. And there are those that would say, well, really, it doesn't even fit in our culture today. But I want to talk to you today about why it matters and why the Bible matters and how you can make it a part of your life so that you can live unshakable. Second Peter chapter 1, he says this, Above all, Above us. So stop and listen is what he's telling us. Stop and listen to what I'm saying. I, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. Like they just didn't decide, hmm, I think that's what that means. He keeps talking. He said, for, for prophecy, for Scripture, never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though human, 
spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. I will tell you that there are 40 writers spanning over 1,600 years that make up the 66 books of your Bible, but there is only one author, and his name is God, and this storyline is about Jesus. That's what this book is about. Now, when you look at these 66 books, I just want to stop. I'm not going to give a history lesson on the Bible today, but I want to give you a little context. 39 of those books make up the Old Testament of your Bible. 27 of those books make up the New Testament. Sometimes we overthink that. And we're like, well, I'm not reading the Old Testament because that's old. Okay, well, let's take the word testament then. Because the word testament is just another word for covenant. So you have the old covenant. Then you have Christ coming. And in the New Testament, you have the new covenant of when Christ has come. And he died on a cross so that you and I could have salvation. And he fulfilled the old covenant. So all of this together tells me the redemption plan and story and how to live my life so that I can live a life that has a strong foundation. My hope for you today is that I can show you the importance of loving the word of God. If you're taking notes today, and we've, we've put several things in your notes, and whether you're following on version. Or, um, through, or you're, you're taking physical notes today, you can write this down. The first thing that I want you to understand today about the Word of God is I want you to love it. I want you to love it. Psalm 119 and 197, he said, Oh, how I love your words. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate, it. I meditate on it all day long. I love your Words. I love your law. Verse 98, he says, your commands are always with me. And look at this. That makes me wiser than my enemies. Some of you are wondering why you're, you, you can't get some victory in your life over some issues and over some things. And, and you keep kind of winding up in the same spot, the same spot of, of, of feeling like, like I can't get all of this together. And it's because you haven't you, you, ha- you haven't found the source to make you wiser than your enemies because what you're trying to deal with, you're trying to overcome your enemy with willpower and you need God power through these incredible words in, these book, in this book to overcome and outsmart the enemy that's trying to destroy you. Now, Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible and every line, all 176 verses are about the word of God. So we have the longest chapter in the Bible is about the Bible. It's kind of like God is trying to tell us something. Like if you'll go read, Psalm, and I want to encourage you to do this this week and start making it a habit. I read, I read Psalm 119 several times a week, if not every day, and I just pick a portion and I start reading. Why? Because it tells me and it shows me the importance of the word of God. If you want to learn to love your Bible, start reading Psalm 119. Just start working through it. Just start, just start reading through that chapter in Psalms. Psalm 119, 165 says this. I read this yesterday morning. He said, great peace have those who love your law. Great peace have those who love your words and nothing can make them stumble. In a world that is going crazy, in a world where there is chaos and unrest, I need great peace. And how can I get that? Because I love his words. Now, I'm talking about loving it so much that you're willing to fight for it and you're willing to defend it. Like, take it personal. Like, like when, I, when it comes to the Bible for me, it comes to the word of God for me, I take it personal. It's kind of like this for me. Don't talk about my mama. Like, I can say she's crazy. She's watching. I love you. But, but you better not say she's crazy. Like, don't talk about my wife. Don't talk about my kids. And for the love of everything right and holy, you better not talk about my beautiful little six-month-old granddaughter because I will cut you. Come on. I just felt like you wanted it. Come on. I, I carry a pocket knife with me everywhere I go. It's in my pocket right now. I'm ready. I'm ready. Like, I'm ready to fight for it. I'm ready to defend it.
defend it because I love them. I love it so much, I'll fight for it. That's how I am with this word. I love it so much that I'll defend it. I'll fight for it because of, the, because of the difference that it's made in my life. And while it's popular to discredit, to disown, or show no regard for Scripture, that makes me bow up just a little bit. Like, come on, bring it on. You, you might as well be talking about my mama or my kids or my grandkids because I'm ready to fight because I love it so much. You say, why do you love it so much? Let me show you. 2 Timothy chapter 3. In verse 16, he said, all scripture is God-breathed. It's God-breathed. The breath of God is on these words. The breath of God that gave you life is the same breath of God that breathed into this book. And and the words, they're not just normal words. They're they're God-breathed words, and they're useful. They're useful for teaching for rebuking. Some of y'all need some rebuking. I need some rebuking. It was just more fun to throw you under the bus first. Right? But I need rebuking. Correcting. I need correcting a lot. And training in righteousness. Why? So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Thoroughly equipped. Well, what he, thoroughly equipped for my decisions. For my family. For my money, for my my mind, for my relationships. I want you to know this book is God breathed. Man held the pen, but God breathed the words in this book. And it matters what your attitude is towards it. What is your attitude towards the Bible, towards the Word of God? Paul praised the church at Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. He said this. He said, and we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, the word received right there in the Greek is dekamai, which I'll explain what that means. You you were ready for it. You received it. You welcomed it, which you heard from us. You accepted it, not as, look at this, not as human word, but as it actually is. It actually is the word of God. And look, he said, which is indeed at work in all of you who believe. You accepted it as it actually is. You were ready to receive it. And this is the posture we have to take. If you're going to love the word of God, you've got to receive it. Like you're going to welcome it. You're going to be ready. You're going to prepare. It's kind of like when, when company's coming over. Husbands, you'll know what I'm talking about. All of a sudden, you're vacuuming things in the house that hadn't been vacuumed in three months. Like, we're going to vacuum the walls. We, have, we never do that. It don't matter. You know, we're going to wash the windows. We're going to wipe, we're going to wipe, we're going to wipe counters they're never, of rooms they're never going to go into. Who are these people coming over? My God, they must be special. And then we're going to have to put all of the pillows on the couch. But they can't sit there. Shut up and put the pillows. Yes, ma'am. Okay. That doesn't happen in my house. That happens at your house. And so you're going to put all of the pillows on the, on the couch. There's nowhere for them to sit. Yeah, but it looks good. We're prepared. We're ready. We're going to put all the pillows on the bed. So tonight, when I go to sleep, it's going to take me about seven minutes to move all the pillows to get in the bed. So I can't lay my head on them, but I can throw them on the floor by the bed. We'll work on that later. Anyway, I mean, I have enough pillows in my house to furnish a small island. But we do these things because we get ready. We, we're, we're getting ready to receive and to welcome someone in. And so in order for me to love the word of God, I, gotta, I wanna be prepared and I wanna welcome and receive it as it actually is the word of God. I want you to love it. These just aren't words. These are supernatural words. These are God-breathed words. Don't just, don't just love it though. I want you to also, the second point, if you wanna write this down, I want you to learn it. I want you to learn it. He said, well, what does that even look like? Well, what do you mean learn it? Well, do what you're doing right now. You're listening to preaching. That's one way that you learn it. You listen. You can write this down. Listen to God's word. Matthew chapter 7, our, our, our theme verse through this is everyone who hears these words. So that means if you hear them, that you must have been listening to the words of God. Romans 10 and 17, so then faith comes by hearing 
and hearing by the word of God. Listen to the word of God. We have hundreds, if not thousands, I don't know how many years, how many years back we go with sermons on the website, but we have hundreds of sermons I know of that you can go listen to and hear great preaching. And there, there, there's Pastor Jonathan, there's guest pastors that you're going to hear great preaching and teaching on the Word of God. Go listen to them. Listen to the Word of God. Something that I did, I picked up about a week and a half ago, just kind of accidentally found it, was I, I guess it would be a, I guess a podcast is what they're calling it, but it's, uh, it's Billy Graham's sermons. It's like 24, 26 minutes long, and they're clips from, from his sermons over the years. I've just started listening to them. Why? Because I want to get, I want to listen to the word of God. It makes a difference. It helps me learn it. The other thing I want you to do is read, read God's word. Matthew chapter four, verse four, Jesus answered and he said, man, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. You can't just live on bread alone. Like, like you I mean, you know, you probably need to stop eating so much white bread anyway. So it's going to be okay. But Jesus said, you don't live on that alone. You will also live on this word, this bread, the bread of life. There's something about the word of God that you live on that gives you sustenance, that gives you faith, that, that, build, that builds you that just regular food alone can. And sometimes we wonder why we don't have the strength to overcome some things. It's again, it's because we're trying it on our own with our own resources and we're not tapping into God breathed words that will change our lives. There's some things in your notes here, and we wrote them out for you, and I want to quickly go through these, and I want to, one of the things I want to encourage you to do, four things on this, get a paper Bible. I said this a while ago, but like, I appreciate all the apps, and I use them. I use YouVersion, Bible Hub. There, there are several of them I use, and continue using those, but there's something about having a paper Bible. There's something about it when I under, it, wow, it, No matter where I open this Bible, this is so cool. No matter where I open this Bible up, I've always got something circle or underlined from over the years. And so when I look at this, it's just kind of a reminder. And then sometimes I'm like, I have no idea what I was doing that day. That was dumb. And um, but most of the time I can find and it takes me back to a moment. And I'll tell you, I don't know where everything in the Bible is, but I know where everything in this Bible is. Because I know that page and I know it was on this side. And when I circle that and I underline that. And it reminds me of what I need. And I want to encourage you, get a paper Bible. Set, a, set aside a time to read. This is really one of our, probably the, you know, the, the, the weakest point of this. We still make it a priority. We just, and, and we're all guilty of this. I'm not pointing fingers. I'm, I'm, I, I'm, the, I'm the worst sinner among us for this. That I've, I'm going to do these other things. I just didn't say I'm going to read my Bible at this time, or this time of day for this long and read through this. That's, that's all you have to do. Uh, have a Bible reading plan. Like, like, like figure out a way that you're going to pick it up and, 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 and work through a plan to read your Bible. And, and if you use one of the, the apps, if you miss a day, it's okay. I, I want to I give you some freedom here today. I, wanna, you know, I want you to be free today. Like when you look down and it says, you've missed 97 days. And you're not going to get a badge for reading. And you're probably going to go to hell. You look at that and you say, get behind me, Satan. No, no. Um, It's okay. Just go to the next day. Don't try to catch that up all night long. Don't be in bondage to the app or to to the plan. Just go to the next day. You'll catch it next year. You'll skip the other days next time. So it'll be fine. But, But get a plan and read through it. And then don't just read the Bible. But let the Bible read you. What I mean by that is when you, get, when you get through reading, close that book and say, God, what are you trying to say to me? What are you trying to work out through me? What are you trying to do in my life? What are you trying to teach me? How are you trying to correct me? How can I learn from this? And then the last thing on, on this part is study God's word. Because we don't just study the Bible to get smarter. And we don't, we don't just know Scripture just so we can tell everybody else how wrong they are. 
but we read scripture. 2 Timothy 2.15 says it this way. And I, I love it. I went back and pulled the King James Version of, of this scripture from, from 2 Timothy. And he said, study to show thyself. It's not shoe thyself. Some of you are like, I already got my shoes on. I've shooed myself this morning. I'm like, no, 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 no. Study to, I love the King James language sometimes. But study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I study, I study it. I read it so I can get in the Bible, but I study it so the Bible can get in me. And I can rightly divide this word and I can, I can study to show myself. And the last thing I want to show you today and I want you to understand is I want you to live it. I want you to live it. Psalm 119, we're back. We're back at Psalm 119. How do, how do we do this? He said, how can a young person, or maybe we could just say, how can a person stay on the path of purity? He said, by living according to your word. By living according to your word. You live it. He said, verse 10, I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I have hidden your word. That means I've taken your word and I've placed it. I've placed it close inside my life. I've opened up the Bible so that it can open up me. And now I'm living this. And now when, 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 when chaos happens, I know where to find peace. When, when tragedy happens, I know where to find strength. When, when, when just, just people go crazy around me, I know the solid rock that I can go to. Why? Because I've hidden your word in my heart so that I know where to go when I need a strong foundation. When the winds blow and the streams rise and the rain beats against my house, I know that my foundation is sure because I have hidden your word in my heart. Ephesians chapter 6, we see the armor of God. You've heard the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. You've heard they are all defensive except one. And Ephesians 6, 17 tells us that taking the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. There's sometimes when you feel like nobody cares about you and you, you just you get beat up and beat down by that and you're wondering why you can't win some battles in your life. It's because you don't have a weapon in your hand that can defeat the enemy that's coming against you. But when I feel like no one cares, I can go to the scripture, the sword of the spirit that says, cast all of your cares on him because he cares for you. When I'm overwhelmed, I can go to the scripture that says, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. I can go to Psalm 91 where I can find out that he is my fortress. He is my refuge. He is my strength. He will hide me in the shadow of the Almighty. He will take me under his wings and he will keep me safe. I can fight back because I have a weapon in my hand to fight what the enemy is throwing at me. Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is alive and it's active. It's alive. Why is it alive? Because these are God breathed words in this book we're all in a battle we're all in a storm how will you fight it how will you survive it how will you overcome it i will tell you that you can do it through the word of god you can have a strong foundation this book can be depended on it has the answers to all of life's questions it tells us where we came from it tells us how to live and most importantly it tells us where we are going the word of God has the very nature of God in it. And that means that it is unchanging. And you don't have a new problem that this book doesn't deal with. Uh, I want to close today with an illustration to show you from my own life the power and the lasting power of the word of God. I have right here, and they're going to put a picture on the screen, but I have in my hand right here a Bible that was given to my grandfather. In 1941, the U.S. Army gave him this pocket Bible, and soldiers would receive these before, before being shipped off to war. He was being sent to Germany during World War II, and they were not sending him on a vacation. 
These Bibles were designed, neat little fact, if you had a brown one, you were in the army, if you had a blue one, you were in the navy. But these, aren't, these, these, uh, these were designed to be carried in your shirt pocket, just like this. To be close to your heart. And there was stories of soldiers that would even tell you they would protect your heart. Later on, a few years into the war, they began to manufacture these Bibles with a steel case and a steel cover on them. And they would sell them and tell them that, put it over your heart, it'll protect you from bullets. Oh, the symbolism. The word of God, close to your heart, protecting your heart. In the front of these Bibles, there was a note from the president. There was actually several cool things in the front of these Bibles. And some of them said to the members of the, arm, of the armed forces. This one said to the member of the army, to the members of the army. As commander in chief, I take pleasure in commending the reading of the Bible to all who serve in the armed forces of the United States. Throughout the centuries, men of many faiths and diverse origins have found in the sacred book words of wisdom, counsel, and inspiration. It is a fountain of strength, and now, as always, an aid in attaining the highest aspirations of the human soul. Very sincerely yours, Franklin D. Roosevelt. Y'all can zoom in on this table. On this table right here, I have, I have four generations of Bibles. I have my grandfather's Bible. I have my mother's Bible. I looked for my dad's Bible. I couldn't find it this week. I have my Bible that was given to me. And I have Brady's Bible. Brady's my youngest. He's 17. He's a senior this year. And we bought both of our boys Bibles. Blake's 25, lives in Birmingham, Alabama. I bought him a Bible when he was a teenager. I bought Brady a Bible when he was a teenager. My grandfather began to build his life on a foundation that was sure. He had no idea that 84, 83, 84 years later, that that same foundation would be holding strong in his family. And that there would be a 17-year-old senior that's building his life. Because right now he's going through the book of Acts and the early church and how it started and the struggles and what was happening there. And, and, and he's reading a reading plan through the book of Acts. And my grandfather had no idea that when he picked up this Bible that was given to him by the U.S. Army, that a foundation will begin to be built that years down the road that that there would be a 17-year-old kid, a great-grandson, that would be picking up a Bible that has the same words this one has in it. And a life would begin to be built based on that foundation. Now, you may say, Matt, I don't have four generations of Bibles to, to stand up there and hold. I, I, don't, I don't have what you have. That's okay. Be this one. Be this one. You have what it takes to be this one. You have what it takes to be this one. You may not have this yet, but you have what it takes to be this Bible. It's so cool, I can hold a Bible that's over 80 years old in my hand. But here's what he didn't know. He didn't know that when he held this Bible, that he'd have a daughter that would hold this Bible. And he would have son-in-laws that would physically build churches, like, like build them from the ground up. He had no idea that he would have a grandson that would pick up a Bible, the same words, and he would become a preacher, and he would be a pastor in a church. He had no idea. He had no idea there would be great-grandsons, and one would be living out his purpose at a local church in Birmingham, Alabama, with the Word of God, and the other one would be living out his purpose every weekend in San Antonio in a local church. He had no idea the impact that it was going to have. That's the power of the word of God. And you can say, again, I don't have all of that. And that's fine. The Bible says too much is given, much is required. I probably have more weight on me because of this. But if that's not your story, this can be your story right here. This can be your story. And you can start. Because I don't want you to just know the Bible. I want you to know the God of the Bible and what he can do in your life. I want you to know the God that breathed these words. 
Because the more you dig into his word, the more you'll find him. And the more you will experience him. And the more you will find his love. And the more you will find his grace. And the more you will find his mercy. And the more you will find direction for your life. And the better decisions that you're going to make. And the things you need to do and accomplish in life. And your purpose will be found because you find it in this book. Find it in this book. I want to pray for you today before we go. And my first prayer is that all of you would find a love for the word of God. That this week you'll pick up a Bible. Start reading Psalm 119. Read anywhere, but if I, I'm just challenging you because of this sermon, read Psalm 119. But maybe you're in the room today and you've never, you've never taken the first step to know the God of the Bible that I'm preaching about. Or maybe you have and you walked away and you're sitting here today and now you're, you're hearing me talk about this God of the Bible we're preaching about. And you know you need a Savior. And you know that you need Jesus in your life. And you know that you don't need to go another day without him. Or today you need to rededicate your life. With heads bowed, eyes closed, nobody looking around. I just want to know who I'm praying for. Romans chapter 6 tells us that the goodness of God leads us to repentance. You're in here today. You're... You're, you're in Bull Verde today. You're in Midtown today. You're watching online today. You're in Stone Oak today because of the goodness of God that is leading you to repentance in what you're feeling right now. So if that's you today, no matter where you're at, what location, and you know you need to say yes to Jesus or you need to recommit your life and rededicate to him, nobody's looking around. Would you put a hand in the air right now? I just want to know who I'm praying for. I'm not going to ask you to stand. I'm not going to ask you to come to the front. I just want to know who we're, we're praying with. Thank you. Keep them up for just a moment. Anybody want to join these? Anybody? My, my, thank you. I see that. I see that. Thank you. Wow. Hands all over the room. Come on, Midtown Boulevard. Anybody else want to join these? Just keep them up for just a moment. Thank you. Thank you. You can put your hands down. I want to pray for you. You can use my words or you can use yours. It's simply a prayer of surrender from the heart. Jesus, I need you. God, I surrender my life to you. I receive what you did on the cross for me. Forgive me of my sins. I need you and I must have you. I'm starting over today. I'm saying yes to you. I give you everything. I trust you with my life. I ask it all in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. Hey, would you clap your hands right now for those who just prayed that prayer. We celebrate with you and with heaven today.